Go ahead. Well, thank you um, all for coming. Um, so my name is Sherry Weaver. I'm the Director of Teacher Preparation here at, uh, at WJAC, and I'm also a graduate student in System Dynamics. And what I'm going to be presenting today is a couple of things. One is a part of a poster presentation that I'm giving in a couple of weeks at the UK SB conference, and also um, showing my model for the very first time. So I have some definite questions and some uh, that I want to ask all of your feedback on, but please feel free to stop me at any time um, with anything that has been said, so feel free to interrupt. And so the topic is um, using a system dynamics approach to inform decision making in STEM education. So here is my motivation, is that there is a STEM workforce shortage in Massachusetts, which I'm going to show you, um, I don't know if I have the data actually, I don't know where I put it in there. Um, but uh, there is a STEM workforce shortage in our state, and less than 45% of Massachusetts high school graduates enter post-secondary STEM programs. And to address this concern, education leaders are starting to think about how do we build up our STEM program by implementing new STEM initiatives. The issue has come is that all these STEM initiatives have been somewhat interesting. Um, they've had varying degrees of success. So some districts do these new initiatives, and they have incredible change that's longer lasting. Sorry. 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 Um, and while as some, you know, some districts implement these new STEM initiatives, and they're able to have incredible success that's longer lasting. And so thinking about how, what are the factors that need to be in place for education leaders to make effective, you know, to have them effectively implement STEM initiatives in their school. And the goal is to attract and prepare students to enter college STEM programs and ultimately in the summer. Well, can I ask a question? Absolutely. So, Sarah, so I, would, I would have seen, if you had said 45% of Massachusetts, I'd be like, that's great. <laughs> I, my mental model would be it's like 15 to 20%, and your target would be 45%. So what's yeah. your target? If that's low, what's your target? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, the, this number I'm struggling with a little bit uh, because I've seen numbers as low as 39%. And um, numbers as high as uh, 44%. Uh, but the target actually has to be quite a bit larger than that. And you'll see in just a moment. Um, because this is the number that enter post secondary STEM programs, but not the number that complete them. Right, okay. So that yeah, can be a problem. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And the other issue is it's not just the number of students that enter post secondary STEM programs, but how that supply can or is not meeting the demand. Of the STEM workforce. Um, so here's the STEM workforce projected growth um, between 2016 and 2026 is 11%, and the projected annual openings. Um, so this is every single year from 2016 to 2026 of um, 47,000 positions every year that open up. And this national. Or this is Massachusetts. It's Massachusetts one. Uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, so here's some uh, other data that I, I struggled a little bit with um, because uh, the only way to get at this information is to, is to ask students that are taking SATs or ACTs. And so in, in this particular chart, what we're looking at is the percent of SAT test takers in Massachusetts that claim that their fourth choice of majors are these subjects. And so 11% um, architecture and engineering, um, I think this is 4% is uh, computer science, and then 10% likely physical science. Um, I do have, you know, again, so this is the SAT exam. They were so, asking a PSAT, I thought years ago when mm -hmm. I took the PSAT. I yeah, I should look for that data as well because they might have that, because that's how students get their college information. So. Uh, but the data that I was looking at at the DESE website focused on SAT. The other data that's, it, and this is where I'm kind of thinking about where to get this from and how reliable this data is, is the ACT exam. So on the ACT exam, um, this number is much, much higher. Um, and my thought is that, uh, that it, it could be that students who are interested in STEM are more likely to take the ACT than the SAT because it includes science. And that's my suspicion. And as a science major myself, we were recommended to do that. I could not, but we were recommended to do that. Yeah. <laughs> so, 
So I'm thinking that definitely skews that data. Um, I included this at 100% so that you could see just how low this is. Um, and as I said, the only thing that I'm questioning about this particularly is the life in physical science. I actually think that would be much higher. So I'm, even though this, um, this comes from the DESI website, I have some questions about what they consider architectural engineering and whether that's truly STEM or whether it's graphic art. So some questions I have about that. And what they consider life in physical science. Uh, the other issue, which I think I mentioned, no, I don't mention it. So the other issue that is concerning is the level of STEM <coughs> readiness as students enter high school. So there's research data that shows that students pretty much decide by about the fifth or sixth grade whether they're going to be STEM people or not. And from that point forward, there's very little um, deviation. And so they decide pretty quickly. And when they decide pretty quickly, it's usually they're opting out. And this is more true of young women than young men. And so, if they're, again, if there's this great in this area. And so when you're looking at STEM readiness, and how I define this is students that receive proficient or advanced on the MCAS exam. Right, again, not perfect data, but it is the data that we have. And the eighth grade is the blue line, um, which you can see is anywhere between 35 and 40, 42 percent. And then the red line is the 10th grade data. And of course, the 10th grade data is a little bit higher. I don't know if it, can anyone think about why that might be. I kind of know why that is. I already have some suspicions. Why would 10th grade data be higher than 8th grade data? And this is readiness. Readiness. They're taking, but they're taking, as, science, they're taking science classes in high school. <laughs> yeah, true. Uh, although there's actually other factors in that, too. Um, so this is, again, Purely measuring STEM readiness by how they perform on the MCAS exam, the science and technology entrance exam. Um, they, they teach to the test in the higher. Partially, yes. Yeah. That's partially it. Um, because in the eighth grade, they're being measured on all of the sciences and tech edge. Uh, they have had less science at that point, although I think schools are changing and districts are changing. We may see this number increase. In the 10th grade, they take one subject level exam. It's going to be usually biology or physics. And so they're only being tested on one subject. That subject is taught in the 9th or 10th grade. And I don't want to say they teach to the test, but the teachers know what's on the test, and that's what they're going to include in the curriculum. So the information is much more narrow. The third reason is that the 8th grade exam is not uh, determined whether a student graduates or not, and the 10th grade exam does. And so I think that there's a lot more energy put into that kind of thing. So, so up to this point of your presentation, you're, you're pretty much saying you got to get the kids in fifth grade. You're making their life choice at fifth grade. I think, what you have, not that they're making their life choice at fifth grade, but the students are often out by the fifth grade. And so that, what that means is that if they have no exposure or they've had really negative exposure to math, they are less likely to want to study that in the future. Right. So that's really what it's about. It excludes a whole lot of stuff for them going forward. It does. That's Stuck by a fifth grade decision. Yeah. When you're yeah. on that, I mean, you're unintentionally taking away a lot of future opportunities. So it's really hard to get in. And that could be another reason why your 10th grade things are, are higher because people who have opted out, you have a more focused group that mm -hmm. you're looking at. And it's interesting. Um, Slightly off topic, but I was talking with a like there's a rookie police officer who um, was trying to keep kids off the street from crime, mm -hmm. and he was like, if you don't get them by the time they're like, I think it was four to seven years old, you, you've lost them. Yeah, and in fact, actually, I mean, again, I know this isn't the same, but I think kids make a lot of decisions pretty early on. Right. And I know in my old neighborhood, the kids were recruited in the gangs by that. Actually, even earlier, they started um, being the lookout by the time they were seven or eight. And so they're starting down a path um, that it's hard to kind of come back from. And so, and so part of the concerns, and at some point, and you'll see in my model that I focus on high school, but my goal at some point is to push it back into elementary school. But I had to start somewhere, and so I started with the high school experience. But we know that those early experiences in elementary school have a huge impact on what students decide to do going forward. And so I'm hoping to do that as I move forward. 
and actually some of the work I'm doing right now specifically targeted with an elementary school that's doing this very, very well. And how are they doing that well? And tracking, they've only been doing, um, implementing this about two or three years, but if I start now, I can track those students through the system and see the impact that this has had, which will be really interesting. Not this particular model, but it's definitely interesting stuff that will, um, that will be coming. And so thinking about then, you know, what, what are the factors that affect students' choice to study STEM? Because if we can um, identify these variables and we can model them and we can work with administrators around what it is that drives students to do this, then we can help them make better decisions. And that's always my goal. Um, so the factors that impact student choice, um, at least this is what I'm putting out there right now, is experience, capacity, and interest. And so when, I, when I'm saying experience, it means it kind of exposure or how much STEM have I had, whether that's in coursework or in internships or any kind of, um, well, mentoring is more like interested. Capacity is their ability or their skill level to do STEM. So what that means is the number of courses that they take in STEM that are, it, you won't see this in the model, I actually need help with thinking about how do I differentiate between number of courses and quality of courses? Because there's certainly a difference. Um, and then uh, the other thing that impacts student choice is their interest or their engagement. So seeing STEM as something that's interesting for them to do, uh, and again, this becomes a little bit trickier for underrepresented students and, um, and young women who are making choices based on societal pressures that may de you know push them away from STEM and from people. So, sounds like you need an attractiveness function. We do which we'll it. be covering today at starting at eleven. Okay, <laughs> 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 Is this a commercial? <laughs> 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 um, no, absolutely. But one of the, we already talked a little bit about attractiveness function in one of the readings. And remember I said that I'm like, oh that's what needs to be in this model at some point is how do we attract students to the subject matter? Mm. Absolutely. Um, so variables that, uh, that I looked at or that I modeled that, influ that, I, that influence these factors are the number of STEM teachers, STEM teacher efficacy, the number of STEM courses, and then the budget that is allocated for STEM. And when we talk about the budget allocated for STEM, not just the percentage, because I have some concerns around that, because if you're increasing the percentage towards STEM, you're taking it away from other things, and that concerns me greatly. But also thinking about how do I get resources from outside of the annual budget, either to start up a program or to sustain a program. So community resources or grants or what have you. In terms of quality of courses versus number, we can, there's co-flow structures that you can look at the average quality of the courses mm -hmm. taken. And the quality itself, you have to sort of define what that means. It's probably right. influenced by things like how good the teachers are, and that's a function of their working conditions, their salaries, if you're attracting the best people who are talented and retaining them. As the teacher-student ratios, you can probably do a better job if you <laughs> don't yeah. have 64 students. <laughs> 30 who are starting fires in the back of the classroom, <laughs> uh, and, and so, so on and so forth. So there's ways that I think of uh, representing that. Yeah, absolutely. I think related to your interest factor too, is it's, I don't know how to phrase it, but it's almost like a, an internal belief that there's an aspirational opportunity to actually advance there. And it's more than just seeing role models similar to yourself. Mm -hmm. It's when society talks about it, like a lot of times with women, it's like, oh yeah, you can be the next Marie Curie, whatever, and right. you know, taught people in their field. So it's like that can almost be counterproductive because, yes. you know, I, I think I'm pretty smart, but I don't know that I'm the Nobel Prize winner and all. And you don't you have to be that yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Perhaps, perhaps not the worst way to find her. She won two Nobel Prizes. But, but, but you know, what I mean, <laughs> women seem to be held to this, like, oh, yeah, you can be this or this or this. It's like, but you don't have to be that, you, you can be like in the middle of the pack and still con contribute. Absolutely, middle of the pack and alternative pathways yeah. too. And so I think diversifying the role models would be truly helpful. And you know, I'm thinking about this woman that I met that worked on the, I'm trying to, I don't remember which space shuttle she worked on. 
uh, but she was a kind of a middle of the pack kid, uh, dropped out of college, went back, and now works, you know, worth it NASA. She's uh, just done amazing, amazing things. And just finding opportunities. So finding women that have gone and underrepresented minorities that have gone these alternate paths. Did you ever see the movie, um, I think it's like The Bottom Sky, Jake Gyllenhaal, October, October, October Sky, Sky. Yeah. Yeah. Laura Dern, about yeah. the rough of the guy went to NASA. Yeah. He was a coal mining kid. Mm -hmm. That was, yeah, that's a, yeah, we used to show quite a that. cool movie. Yeah. It is cool. We, had, we used to show that to our students in engineering, in the seventh degree engineering course, when we were taught that. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing that I had to tell them, you have to get over the 50s clothes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it definitely shows kind of the influence a teacher can have on absolutely. a student. Oh, absolutely. Um, so definitely. So not only just the, the number of STEM teachers, but the type of diversity and where they are in the overall system. Um, some of the diversity studies that I'm seeing are, you know, the female STEM teachers are in K through 12, if anywhere, less so in the um, higher education and, right. and students and again it's it's hard to attract like when there's no like to attract. absolutely and that, that's also true um, with racial diversity yeah. too and so even um, in, in my program the teacher preparation program one of our one of the, the findings that I have to address in the next three years to get relicensed is how am I going to attract diverse students to STEM to the STEM teacher field it makes you feel any better on the on the science side, like in the government, the people who want these people are looking to figure out how to attract more diversity in STEM. So I mean, they're, it's coming from both. This, no, this need is definitely so. The need started in the workforce and it's filtering back. Um, and I mean, that's actually what's driven this. So there's that the book rising above the gathering storm, um, which kind of brings that workforce need to the forefront. It's what really pushed them and kind of puts some impetus behind it. Why are you implicitly identifying the leverage point as the younger kids as opposed to helping the 45 or 40, whatever the number is, uh, not melt away, keeping all of them get through the system? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good as point. As a different leverage point or possible right, leverage absolutely. point. Absolutely. Um, that's a good question. Uh, right, and actually you'll see in the model that I'm actually focusing on high school, because, but eventually I want to push back. Um, and so I think the what we're going to find is the leverage points at the high school are different than the middle school that are different from elementary school. The problems are different as well. And so um, I don't know that I'm answering your question, except that um, that I started as close when I created this model, I started as close to students going into college um, as the problem. And then and then at some point, dealing with that um, STEM readiness going into high school, dealing with that. Unless you mean that, oh, you're talking about like the university, the attrition at, at the university. Yeah, the, oh, you said, okay. let's say, uh, uh, less, since mm -hmm. the last 45% go in and I said, wow, that seems to me like a high number. He said, right. there's, among other things, there's a melt that a melt. not ever, all those folks make it through, they drop out or whatever. I said, what if the policies were directed to making that not happen? All 45% make it through. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, a really good point. That, that might be a different kind of uh, attack, policy attack, and that's resource allocation. No, that no, you're abs that's really an interesting idea, and I think one of the to address it from the K twelve world is how do I prepare? You know, how does the K twelve community prepare their students so that they can more effectively finish their first year? Because if they finish the first year, they're more likely to finish. Right? Um, so. You know, I can't speak to university policies, but I definitely can speak to the K-12 community as we're trying to prepare the students to enter these places. And so maybe that then gets at the quality of courses rather than the quantity. And so think you know, about how do I truly- STEM boot camp or something that uh, somebody has to go through. If you're headed to a STEM program, mm -hmm. before you get there and going through boot camp, <laughs> right. make sure that when you, that you're ready. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't get slaughtered. Well, don't and the other, you know, the other thing is, is that students who have resources, so upper middle income or upper income students, they have many opportunities outside of the K-12 community that other students don't have. And so when they're walking into their first year of college, not only do they have their high school experience, 
but they have all of the other things. They have the after school programs and the summer programs and the parents who read to them since they were five years old and they have all of these other things. And so I think that's another factor that's outside of the K-12 high school, but is definitely something that should be considered at one point is the community or the impact of out of school time programs on students, particularly those who are um, from different economic statuses. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I imagine you could say, look, you can, you know, it's voluntary or um, you can test out of the boot camp or put like a podium and throwing stuff on the yeah, water. Yeah. Uh, it might be the summer before you go to university. So right. instead of, uh, you know, cutting grass in the summer for the town parks, you're going to be funded to go to this. Let's make sure you're ready to, <laughs> to attend the thing. Right. And, you know, there could be fun stuff at it, too. It doesn't have to be all, you know, but uh, some such so that when they hit the ground, or and the kids who have it, these other advantages need be not. I mean, they probably would be welcomed, but they wouldn't be you know, pushed to go there if they were yeah. so redundant. Yeah. <clears throat> anyway, just throwing some no, I, policy. I, no, absolutely. And, you know, and I'm thinking about even in some of the small towns around here that are under-resourced, um, and so urban schools have different types of resources than some of the small towns, let's just put it that way. And so thinking about how can some of these small under-resourced towns implement programs that are inexpensive enough that there's, you know, again, kind of middle of the pack kids can go and get some more exposure. I think that this out of school time, you can push it earlier too, and we'll get at this interest as well getting them engaged. Um, so um, so I also looked a little bit at, at teacher recruitment. This is a part of the model that, that has to get a little more fleshed out um, because one of the issues when we talk about quantity of STEM teachers, there's quantity of course and there's quality, but at this point there just aren't physically enough STEM teachers. There just aren't enough of them and so this becomes a problem that there are openings and there's no one to fill those openings. And so people are recruited from a variety of places. Um, sometimes they're recruited out of industry. Um, so they have zero teaching experience. Sometimes they're recruited from other majors. So they have zero STEM experience. And, and we see, and then any variety of that. And there are problems with both sides of that. So people who come in from industry who have a tremendous amount of knowledge have no ability to teach can actually be as detrimental as um, teachers who are taken from a different subject area like English or history or phys ed and are sold. Okay, you're teaching physics this year, you know. Um, <laughs> so, would you, would you say the students move into the post secondary to become a STEM major? Mm -hmm. Does that include whether they will be employed also in STEM majors or become STEM teachers? So that includes both STEM industry majors and STEM teachers. Because that's, I mean, if there is a shortage of STEM teachers, mm -hmm. and you're trying to reallocate teachers from the existing pool. Uh, oh, you mean that the the uh, workforce shortage? I did not include STEM teachers in that workforce shortage. Yeah, because who yeah, would be providing the supply? That's there, that's you, just industry. This is a similar <laughs> problem to one that has been modeled for a growth in the system dynamics society. Mm -hmm. And it's the same idea. You got to get people interested in system dynamics. Mm -hmm. If they are, you got to train them well. Mm -hmm. and who are the trainers? The veteran teachers who often go to consulting. Because right. uh, there's more money, Absolutely. and the weaker people try and train the new people, and they get trained poorly, they produce bad models, yeah. and there's less demand for system dynamics. So that sort of so that, that, that sort of thing is very good model. It's in the literature. We might, might take a peek at that. There might be some ideas for your model as well. Yeah. So what the uh, okay. I think it's in the system dynamics review. We did in the proceedings. We did a model scheme as well as well. No, that would be, that would be great. That's definitely something that should be modeled at some point. Um, and so, some of the well, I already talked a little bit about the recruitment challenges. Is that there just physically aren't enough STEM teachers out there, um, as evidenced by my students that get multiple efforts. I mean, multiple um, uh, offers to teach, and I'm already starting right now to get emails, uh, probably by. 
looking for uh, mostly physics, chemistry, and a couple of bio teachers. Um, so, uh, so we see this problem uh, in that it's just the supply, of course. So some strategies that have been tried uh, to, again, greater or lesser degree of effectiveness is offering hiring bonuses for STEM teachers. Or, and I see STEM teachers, it's actually true of teachers that are also in great need in other areas. Uh, the highest need for teachers is actually special education, moderate to severe special ed. The second highest need is physics. And then the third or fourth highest need is chemistry. And so, so some hiring bonuses have put it, been put out by the state. That program happened a while ago until I got into teaching. Uh, but the training was so poor that many people left the program really quickly really early on. Some other recruitment strategies are the loan forgiveness, although that has a bad rep right now, as I'm sure you've heard on NPR. Uh, so loan forgiveness programs, the problem with those is that they're not consistent. And so um, you may have, there may be a loan forgiveness program right now. I could tell the students about it in my program, but it won't be there in four years. There's no guarantee that it's there. What is the loan forgiveness? So this um, is a program usually by the federal government, although there are some state programs depending on the state that you go to, that will forgive your student loans if you teach in a high needs district. And so for students who come here to WPI that have racked up a ton of debt, and our, most of my students go into industry because they want to pay off their student loans and then they want to be teachers after that. Uh, so, yeah. But so, talking to a student the other day, I said, let's look at some loan forgiveness programs. And he, that's amazing. Like, I just thought I'd have to eat ramen for the next uh, There's a way to, uh, to attract students, to graduates to become STEM teachers. Correct. Yeah. And that if we can say to students, one, STEM teaching is a legitimate career, um, where teachers are really happy. In Massachusetts, they're fairly well paid. And there are programs like this where we can take care of like the WPI student debt. Um, I think we would get more students in the program. So. Um, oh, there we go. So this is a part of the model. I can actually show you the whole thing. This is just a piece of it. Uh, so this was modeled in Sustea. Um, it was part of Kim Warren's class. And I'm using this because I'm designing in the UK, so uh, it will make sense. At some point, this will be, I'll translate this over to Benson. It's just not there right now. Um, so you can see that the recruitment strategies are not in the model yet because it's a different uh, problem that has to be modeled later on. But what we see here is this average STEM hiring rate um, at uh, 5%. And, and of course, in the model, we can increase that rate, and it, that need to increase that rate actually is driven by the number of STEM courses that are offered in another piece of the model. The goal for that is to try to retain teachers so that they don't leave the profession because they're overworked. And so um, they become overloaded because as the demand for STEM classes increases, then you end up with uh, larger, more classes, larger numbers of classes. And um, what I've seen too is that teachers often are teaching not just one subject, but they're having to teach three, or sometimes even um, all, well, one year I had to teach all four subjects. So biochem, physics, and engineering. And so I didn't model that piece of the sheer how many different classes you teach, but how many students that you have and how many classes that you have. So purple are decisions. The purple are decisions, correct. And so this is average STEM hiring rate. Again, the concern that I have around this average STEM hiring rate is if, I inc if that gets increased, if that's a decision that the district makes, they have to pull the money from somewhere. And so um, these are aspects that the district has to consider. The other concern too is that I can increase the, I can look at my budget as an administrator and I say I'm gonna hire more STEM teachers, um, but they're, if they're not physically there, then it doesn't matter. So, um, so there's a school locally that had a physics teacher position available, and they, well, yeah, they have a physics teacher position available. They got zero applications, and so they took the kids and randomly re redistributed them throughout the school because they couldn't offer physics that year. If they don't get a physics teacher this year, they'll have to do the same thing. So, um, so that's kind of a problem with that. Um, so, and again, yeah, this is part of a different part of the model, but thinking about PD, which we'll talk about in a minute. 
So those kids did not take this at all. Mm -hmm. They couldn't even, like, if there's another school that has a good webcam and such, they could just put the kids in the mm -hmm. classroom. Yeah. Have some monitoring and have the other kids from another school teach. I know, that would be a great idea, but um, yeah. So I'm, I'm trying to see what feedbacks are acting here mm -hmm. on. It seems that we're focusing on STEM teacher stock. Mm -hmm. What uh, what's the hiring and what uh, what increase the hiring and what decreases the the attrition? Right. And I can see, for example, that, that this like a positive feedback loop from the the more STEM teachers you have, or so. What's happening for the intake? The the average hiring rate mm -hmm. is it a function of how many STEM teachers you have? Correct. Because yeah. How does that work? Is it a gap? It's a constant, right? Or yeah. Just a this is yeah. This is a constant of um, yeah, and it's um, kind of sorry. The new STEM teachers. Mm -hmm. I'm saying not the hiring rate. Sorry, the hiring rate is constant. Right. But there is a. STEM teachers are feeding into the right. Correct. Those are teachers that are coming out of teacher preparation programs and alternative programs. Um, and so where that number comes from is data from the DESE website. I don't know if that answers your question. I thought the STEM teachers are those who are in the stock of STEM teachers. Correct. Are they... I'm trying to say... Is this so it looks like a 5% like growth rate. You know, five 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 ten 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 the yeah. first order positive. Yeah. 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 I'm just trying to think physically what, or in reality what this what is mean? really going on. What is going on? Yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic question. Um, so thinking about the number of STEM teachers that are in the system and the number that are <coughs> leaving the profession and then that that is feeding into the flow and so it ha it just happens to be that or just again i was just looking at the data itself is that uh in the state of massachusetts there's an average um, hiring rate of five percent of whatever stem teachers i have it is growing by five percent i see yeah Okay, so that's that's the policy. Well, yeah. Alternative way of doing it would mm -hmm. be if you think of the ordering functions we looked at, the right. genetic structures, and there's a desired number of STEM teachers right. based on student interest and what have you, and then they have to go get them, hire them, and make them right. somehow, right? And uh, then there's this issue of, well, are there teachers to be hired or not? Right. Because you can make yeah. supply and demand. No. So and that I, would be a different way of uh, exactly. approaching. And then you could compute the... Uh, Ratios of flows to stocks will compute the percentage and tune it to match the present five percent. No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, yeah, I'm also thinking that what I'd like to think about too is how to how to feed into this from the teacher preparation programs in our state um, and how those again dealing with that supply issue. You know, where are these teachers coming from? Yeah, so on the supply yeah. side, there would be a stock of presumably unemployed uh, uh, STEM, STEM teachers, teachers, and they would be trying to match up with the demand for uh, oh, graduates from uh, yeah, graduates from, from, from that's essentially it. Yeah, and you know, if there's an imbalance, pressure would be directed to the system through higher salaries or better marketing or loan forgiveness. Or yeah, to attract that's a good point. To, I mean, it would be nice if it was higher salaries, <laughs> but yeah. yeah or, or whatever, whatever attracts, it is. And, or that could be a policy, right? Because you can identify, look, a leverage point here is if we could attract more here at this point in the system, look what happens. Right. Now you have to figure out how to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And that would, actually, I like that idea because that will help me think about how to include those loan forgiveness programs and the hiring bonuses and into this. Again, we get back into attractiveness. What, what right. attractiveness function? What's the attractiveness of being a, uh, STEM teacher. Mm -hmm. What are the factors, the multi-criteria, uh, that multiple criteria that go into that being a better Absolutely. job choice than the next best alternative? Yeah, no, that that would be fantastic. And actually, I started doing that a little bit. We um, have a phys tech site grant, and the goal is to increase the number of physics teachers. And one of the reasons. One of the ways we're doing that is we're um, putting out there, kind of debunking the myths of STEM teachers. The STEM teachers don't get paid anything, but they're 
or they're unhappy, that blah, blah, blah. And so, um, so we're actually going to be physically doing that. Because to give an example, we've got Oleg and myself sitting here, and uh, we could both work in industry if you want. I mean, you've got an MBA from Cornell. I mean, I'm sure you could work in industry with it, let <laughs> alone your PhD. But yet we're sitting in this row. So obviously being a professor, now it's not quite a STEM teacher, but it's a teacher, you know, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, was more attractive than industry. So what made us decide that this is a good use of our time to do this? It certainly wasn't the money. Right. <laughs> relative to what we could command in industry. So there's other aspects. Right. Freedom of to do what you want to do, the academic lifestyle, you know, whatever. So I think that um, I think that identifying that sort of stuff might be I think that crucial. would I, I agree with that. And what's interesting and, and what I have to think about are what are the decisions when we're looking at multiple levels of the school system. So there's the school based decision making that goes on. Um, but what you're talking or what we're talking about here is that state level decision making um, that because the you know or even federal I mean we might be actually talking about multiple levels of decision making that's going on right um, so from the state level funding these bonuses funding loan forgiveness programs in order to make um, STEM teaching more attractive is not really it's really not a district level decision it's a, a university I mean a State level decision. And so thinking about how to how to model that. Yeah, because that's a great. You're making a wonderful point mm -hmm. in that in system dynamics we always try and <clears throat> whatever we're doing mathematically that makes something interesting happen in the model. Ask the question in the real system what is that thing? You know the real decision makers are going to have to be uh, advised to do this this this. And I so this lever when you pull it good things happen. Well who who pulls that lever? Right. Uh, the Secretary of the Department of Education in Washington, or the state superintendent, or the local principal, or whatever. And then which way, which lever do they pull? Which direction do they pull? And all that stuff. Although what's interesting and what you're making me think of is, is what are the decisions then that can be made at the district level? They can't make decisions about, um, you know, they can't really make decisions about their uh, who's out there, you know, in terms of what they can offer them. But they can make decisions around forming partnerships with higher education universe, you know, institutions who have these teacher prep programs. So thinking about districts that want to form partnerships with me because they know I turn out the most physics teachers, for example, those are decisions that actually schools can make. And so maybe that I can think about how to feed that into that supply side of the teaching, you know, and thinking about these these partnerships between higher ed and K-12 around the STEM teacher workforce. I don't know, I have to think about how to put that in there, but that's a decision they can actually make. They can't make these other decisions. They have to yeah, so, so you know, who's yeah. your audience, who's the user of your yeah. model, and because they won't use it unless it unless it's speaks to them, and they can know what they can do right. at, at their place in the system to influence them. Yeah. Hopefully, because and then you find a feedback-rich model, most of the buttons and levers they can push and pull that and don't do good. much. You get the same as policy resistance. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so in teacher, so the other thing that I looked at was the teacher or model is the teacher development. So this is efficacy in teaching STEM. And so what I define, and I'm looking for the right word here, in um, education research, the word has been capacity, uh, but the problem is capacity, capacity has another meaning in a lot of other places uh, that is different than the meaning it has in education. So as uh, education researchers, we're trying to think about what's the right word here. So right now I'm using the word efficacy. Um, and what I mean by efficacy is a teacher's ability and confidence in their ability to teach STEM. So that's what I mean by that. Uh, so thinking even about some other words that we use in education, or a word that's coming out more that I've seen just recently is the word agency. Uh, but I know that too has a meaning in business that is different than in education. Yeah, we might say effectiveness in system maybe. Yeah. It's maybe a typical phrase in the world. So There's nothing right or wrong. No, it's just a more a matter of how I put this, trying to find right. that right, right word that actually and incorporates in what I'm trying right. to do. Right, and, and the default should be the users of the model, what resonates with them, what do they call it? 
if, right. you know, you like trousers, but was ever going to use it says pants, use the word pants. Exactly. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, so, so I just put capacity plus agency so that having what they need and the belief that they can do this. I think one way to think about these variables that experience skills and load is how to change them. Mm -hmm. Like uh, some structures address experience as time spent. So this means it grows with time, skills is training, and then capability as you probably have done it with Kim is that the more you use your skills, right. this will improve the capability, which is somehow includes the experience and the skills together. Correct. So I think you're juggling, you want to match the literature or the subject matter you're, you are researching and the tools that, the, uh, the modeling and simulation mm -hmm. tools to how they express or they deal with such concepts. Right. And there are structures for presenting experience, there are structures for showing skills or the growth of skills. And then the load would be, it really depends if it is the student ratio or it's the number of courses per semester mm -hmm. or per year. Uh, but these are from the modeling side. Yeah, the skills and experience are probably stocks, right? Yes, yeah, stocks. Bill and drain based on one word. You could use in economics, we use a production function and say these things are on the right hand side and outcomes, not widgets, but uh, teaching acumen or effectiveness or what have you, this sort of thing. So there, there are techniques, as, as Ruffin is correctly saying, for uh, genetic molecules, whatever you want to say, for doing representatives. Right, absolutely. And then you can combine them together because I, mm -hmm. I think what you're saying. But all these three together, maybe four or five, in yeah. education, they have a certain name. Right. In modeling, you can present them as molecules, and then whatever yeah, you do with the outcome of those, that's something you need to ground. And you yeah, and this, is, this is a great example. I'm glad you said This is a great example of um, how we talk about generic structures and molecules and every modeler. You, know, you shouldn't always be inventing a first order positive feedback loop system every time you're, you know, you should have, you know, learned that at some point, and then you just have it in your hip pocket and you use it when you need it. So there's these molecules, generic structures that are, well, generic, mm -hmm. but then there is domain-specific molecules that you would, a modeler would typically, if you work in finance, you, you have uh, you know, that present value molecules that you just grab and use all the time. So you, as an educational researcher, will probably create some of these things, test them mm -hmm. to your satisfaction, and then you have those as your education-specific or STEM education-specific uh, structures that you'll use in all different contexts. Mm -hmm. So it's career-wise for the long run worth developing these uh well, these molecules. Well, that makes sense yeah and as Rob said the teaching load is actually modeled as um, number of stem courses number of students per course and um and so you'll you'll see that in a minute teaching skill or teaching experience is just at this point i just modeled it as experience gained per year so making that assumption that as that as teachers teach, they get better at it. Um, that it's not actually as simple as that, but we have a head start somewhere. Yes. It's actually not true. Um, yeah. There's a tremendous amount of, of growth in their capacity in their first five years or so. And after that, it actually kind of levels off a little unless there's an influx of something, whatever that something is. And so thinking about what those Another thing that uh, leaps to mind is the work that's been done. Uh, Rafa has done some. There's been stuff mm -hmm. done in the past on uh, modeling at university. Yep. Quality College that Dennis Meadows developed, and mm -hmm. Rafa's work, and so forth. And there's, I, there, some of these same concepts are in those models, and look there to see what how others have mm -hmm. represented some of these ideas. Right. No, absolutely. Um, and then teaching what I'm calling skills. Um, the, this I actually modeled through their exposure to professional development, um, and not just their professional development in pedagogy, not or um, in STEM specific content, but their pedagogy. I mean, the professional development in STEM pedagogy, which is a specific, um, really valuable variable that will impact teacher efficacy. And so, um, because this is kind of a mess in the model, I actually had to take pictures of it, and then I'll show you the, the actual thing in a minute. Okay, you can kind of see that. Uh, so where this connects, just so you kind of think, so this can, yeah, this connects over here, but it would have looked weird on the slide. 
so um, so you can see the uh, the green box in the middle is that STEM educator efficacy, and these three pieces are uh, feeding that into that. Mouse. Which mouse is yours? Or that oh, mine, mine doing that? Yeah, you no, it's mine doing. Never seen a mouse like that's a cool mouse. Yeah, sorry, that's all right. Look, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a shiny object. I like that. I'm like a crow with a shiny object. <laughs> Sorry. So we told you we'd probably turn it off. You're oh, just going to be blown away. Okay. <laughs> um, so, so what I was looking at here was three things, although I think there are more than this. This is just where I started, is STEM teaching experience. And this is what you were talking about. This comes right from Kim Warren's stuff yeah. about the, um, years, the of years of experience and how it grows per year. And that feeds into the STEM educator advocacy. The class side is actually the load the load size, and then the professional development, I'm still working on that piece because I can't I can't figure out how to do the function thing in Sustain. Um, but the effect of PD on teacher efficacy as well. So there we have experience, we have teacher load, and we have um, skills here. And these are specifically STEM pedagogy professional development experiences. And so what we're looking at, or the decision here is, the number of hours of STEM PD. So there's a certain amount of professional development that all districts provide to their teachers every single year. Um, of that professional de development, usually zero is STEM, actually. Um, maybe maybe six hours a year. Uh, this but, is like a rate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's no, it? Six hours per year? Yeah, six, usually. Or six hours, yeah, in, a, in an academic year. Um, and then the, there are a number of skills that are gained from these six hours. I would, yes. Okay, yes. So six so hours trying to per, figure out. per mm -hmm. hour or per professional hour per year. Mm -hmm. And then they will accumulate as a stock of skills. Isn't it? Potentially, yeah. I haven't thought about how, So I'm, I had this modeled a certain way that. Kim Warren did not like, so I'm trying to fix it. <laughs> this professional development, this is where I'm struggling right now, is thinking about how to represent the effect of teacher exposure to STEM professional development on their efficacy. Like, how do I do that piece? Because what I want to be able to show administrators is that we can, if we offer more hours of STEM specific PD or we allow teachers. Well, and, and again, they're not they're probably not going to build it into their typical PD schedule, but they can offer hours outside of that. They can offer money, they can offer time out of class, or there are things that they can do to actually increase the number of um, STEM professional development that their teachers are allowed to engage in. They can make it part of their common planning time, they can do all kinds of things. But thinking about how do I how do I model that impact of exposure to STEM PD on a teacher's efficacy because it increases their skill level. That's what I'm asking. I think right now it doesn't model it, right? No, so it doesn't. It's just a, just a, a right now it's like, it just goes into it because I need to figure it out. There's a PD function, but this is a graphical function? It is. Right, so it just basically increases efficiency for the yeah. PD or that one. Mm -hmm. That's how it works. Yeah. Oh, wait, so let me show you this and then I'll, I'll pull up the model itself. Yeah, we don't want to stop you, but yeah, <laughs> this is something that. Yeah, no, it's, it's one of those things that um, this is when I'm actually, I'm, I'm really struggling with that piece of it. Um, and yet I think it's one of the most vital pieces of the model that I'm struggling with um, because I think it's the one thing that administrators can do that can really drive teacher efficacy up. Um, so, administrative decisions uh, that I have built into the model. Our target MCAS scores, which actually drives the number of STEM courses offered. Um, so, and when we say target MCAS scores, target MCAS scores meaning students who pass the MCAS by getting um, at least proficient. Uh, the professional development budget, um, as well as professional development offerings, I didn't put that in there, but that's there too. And then hiring and recruitment strategies are what I would like to model at some point. So here's here's the model itself. Oh, it's, why is it not coming up? Um, probably need 
just switch a screen. Uh, oh, it says my screen share is mm -hmm. Wait. She's not gonna do that. There we go. I think it's fine. Oh no. You can minimize the the point. Uh, can you hold it and shift it? She's not gonna do that. She's on Zoom. I'm logging in. She's using uh, yeah. So she's sharing this, right? Maybe you share it. No, because it's it's your. Are you sharing? Just share it. Yeah, oh, you might be sharing something else. So yeah. stop the sharing and reshare. Ah, uh, okay. Like the only sharing PowerPoint. Yeah, the uh, desktop over here, right? Yes. Yeah, the screen. The screen. The screen. Yeah, the upper left. There we go. Is it there now? Yes. yes. Ah, excellent. Thank you. So let me pull, go over to that side, but remember, there's like this piece down here. But I'm not worried about this. This comes right out of here. I'm not worried about that. At some point, I do have to think about how to model the fact that this do that, that doesn't actually happen, that teacher experience doesn't just naturally grow with, I mean, their efficacy doesn't naturally grow and their experience doesn't naturally grow every single year in the same way, um, that it tapers off unless, uh, unless there's some kind of uh, implementation or support or change in the system. Uh, but anyway, so here's, Here's where we're. I'm going to make it larger so that you can help me think about this. Yeah, on the, on the skill thing there, off the top of my head, there'd probably be some sort of fraction of the STEM faculty who participate in uh, continuing ed or whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, and then uh, the fraction, there's some parameter, let's say, that determines uh, how much per unit of time. Uh, kind of for miles and years or whatever, uh, per year or whatever. Um, the skills they acquire, and that goes into a stock, and then the, uh, you can compute the average skill level of the STEM faculty. And then be a, as they retire or die or whatever, do other things, the skills go away at the average level. It's a, this is a yeah. Heinz Copo structure. And then um, there would be some incentive, there'd be a normal fraction that participate. There's somebody that always just wants to do it because they like to learn. Right, exactly. But then there's incentives, you know. Uh, you get paid to, to do it, you get the course release, you know, whatever the incentives would be, a uh, table function or something that boosts that above that normal fraction. Yeah. Can you zoom out just to see the complete sure, moment? Absolutely. Although I don't look at the side piece because I leave the random piece in there. <laughs> So, all right. It's nice that you there's have random stuff on the right hand side. Each, uh, each group together. <laughs> they know attention to the random stuff on the side. <laughs> this is what goes on. It's, yeah, good, it's nice I'll, the way you click away. each. Yeah. Area <laughs> <a different color. laughs> well, it, it's because oh yeah, definitely don't pay attention to the far right. It's because at some point I was I was hoping to um, attach this STEM teacher development from the from the point at which they enter the teacher preparation program until they leave. And I thought I was going to find a way to connect it back and then I did it. Okay. No, I, I think what you're doing is a good strategy by you're organizing your work and you know what, what, what is connected and what's not connected. Modular. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that, that's, I was just trying to see if there is any feedback that goes between uh, the um, because you want us to focus on the professional development, this piece, and I want yeah. to see where these arrows are coming from or going to. Right. Like this one, see. Right, right, right. This is going to you know, the. I don't know where is it going. No, that's <laughs> not going. No, that doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, it just right goes now. to the efficacy. Right now, it's just yeah. So right. efficacy is not used for anything. That's why I can get away with that. Yeah. It's not Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I have a, a, a sort of a nuts and bolts model question. So sure. each of these pieces, sub pieces of mm -hmm. your model, were they tested in isolation fully before they were connected to anything else? Um, so some of them were, yes. So and I mean that's how Kim runs his class is that he had just he has us build pieces of it, and then at the end, and so we do that throughout the course, and then we connect them all. The only thing that was not tested, which I think is where I'm struggling the most, is this efficacy piece. Um, the reason I ask is where, where rookie modelers get into the um, 
most problem, mm -hmm. most trouble is they have a lot of domain knowledge usually. Right. They're, and they're very enthusiastic. For sure. And they they lay a lot of stuff into the electronic paper, a lot of concepts, a lot of their mm -hmm. their knowledge with great enthusiasm and start connecting stuff together. But they don't take the time. To, I'm not saying you did or didn't. I'm right. just throwing sure. this out there. That, um, that, that you, that, so that's okay to brainstorm that way. You just start to get your ideas out there. But then you got to pick one place one stock <laughs> and, and then, start there and let's test the, mm -hmm. just one stock and one flow in isolation. Is there a molecule that I can use here? Right. So, so, and then when I fully understand what that little piece is going to do, then and only then do I hook it up to something else. Right. And, and then are the dimensions correct? And, on, and, and if you, and, and if you, then, then you build up to a bigger structure that way. Now when you have a sector done, now you start on another sector and then you connect the two sectors together. And if you got a one-way feedback, the, the blue to the purple maybe, it's usually no big deal. But if then you got the purple going back to the blue, usually everything goes haywire. Because now you've got, you've got feedbacks in the sectors and right. between the sectors, and you've got to rethink the equilibrium or whatever. So that's mechanically, and I don't know if you proceeded that way or not. It sounds like right. Kim was sort of getting you guys on the right. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. so, what, so what was tested um, even the one that's not connected yet, because I haven't figured out how to do that. Um, um, so this one, these four, were all tested in isolation. Um, what wasn't, and what I threw in at the end, which I think is, I think is the one of the most important pieces, but it's the one that needs the most work, is how is this? And so this is kind of so these. Four have been tested, but this is where I'm. I think it's going to have the greatest impact, and I have to think about how to. Where Where do I go next with making this work? The teacher advocacy part. So I'm wondering, like the way you talk about it, like you say that mm -hmm. there are rookies and they learn for five years intensely, and then they kind of slow down and they learning experience. Correct. So I wonder potentially. if this is, potentially could be the two stocks for the rookies versus the experienced ones. Right. And then you may want to, so I wonder. See, I wonder. this is what we kind of have yeah. over here. But this is possibly like even more stocks than you need. Mm -hmm. It's just the way you talk about it. Right. And then have like two co-flows for each of those. Or maybe just for the experienced ones, I don't know. Where you have. Because indeed, professional development contributes to the increase of skill. Right. Of course, alternative is to have a perfect mixing, like one stop for all the teachers, right? Right. So, yeah, and that's why, so this piece that I didn't connect is, I, I think that's just what you're speaking to. And because I, I think you're right that somehow this is going to is going to connect here, and I just haven't thought about how to do that yet. Um, so this this part of STEM teacher development really takes it looks at teachers from the point at which they enter teacher prep programs to those that enter teaching. Now there are things that are not here. There are pieces that are not here, and part of that is um, what causes teachers to go from being a beginner first, you know, beginner. No, it's actually this. So thinking about what makes a teacher go from this to this, that's where that PD, I think, is going to flow. I think that's going to impact that. Um, but what's not included in this part, and it's, and then I couldn't figure out how to make it happen anyway, is, um, is people who don't go through this structure. You know, people who, teachers that don't flow through that structure that way. So people who are career changers. And come in completely in a different place. We call but those yes. professors of practice. At WGI. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that, but I think that's what you're getting at, right? Is yeah. is how do how do we go from, you know, how does PD feed in or this impact of PD on teacher efficacy or teacher development? How does that feed into moving teachers along in this system from becoming beginner teachers to experienced teachers to effective teachers. Right now, going from beginning to experience is just, I've been in it five years, so now I'm experienced. But there's a piece of this that there are experienced teachers that some of which become effective and some of them which never do, they love law. And so that's where I think, does that make, that make sense? 
And so would you differentiate the effective teachers as a separate group, or do you want just to have an average kind of effective efficiency? Yeah. That's, that's a great experience. question. I mean, is it like, is the job so obvious that there's like experience versus efficient? Effective. Um, I think it's, <laughs> it's obvious when you see it, but it's not obviously defined. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what I mean? If you ask somebody what I'm saying, what I mean by that is we know what it looks like, it, we know what it looks like when we see it, but we can't, but we have trouble defining it. Um, but which doesn't get at your question. Uh, the way that it's actually defined in this model is by teacher ratings. I just took people who rated exemplary on their teacher ratings. But that's incredibly, in the real world, that's super subjective. So, um, so I can be rated exemplary at Doherty, but at Worcester Tech, I would not be. Well, then that also opens up a huge can of worms. Like in the marketing literature, there's a big distinction between customer satisfaction and service quality, right? They're related, but they're not the same thing. Yep. Think about two by two matrix, you can have uh, uh, good teacher, poor teacher, effective teacher, ineffective teacher, and then high ratings and low ratings. Mm -hmm. And of course, people are thinking on the diagonal. High ratings equals good teacher, low ratings equals poor right. teacher or ineffective teacher. Mm -hmm. But you can have an effective teacher, but is not well liked. He's gruff, uh, hard grader, whatever. So he doesn't like the guy, or is, doesn't tell jokes, whatever. But you test them later, and geez, they learn their stuff. Right. Or you can have a beloved teacher uh, who is funny and easygoing and whatever, and the kids get out of the class and they haven't learned anything. Right. You know. So um, it's tricky business ferreting out the It is, and actually, so the, um, the effective teacher, when I say that, that comes from teacher evaluation data. Um, teacher evaluation, that's another whole thing that could be modeled that is not, I'm not ever going to do, but someone could do it. It is uh, the pieces that feed into the teacher evaluation system, which include uh, MCAS scores, it includes um, parent data, student data, and um, observation data. It actually it compiles all those things. But again, fairly subjective. Uh, and I think there are pieces in that that kind of uh, alter alter it based on the socioeconomic status of your school too, so that you don't be saying that it's teachers that every year decide to teach in urban schools or rural schools. I think from the modern perspective, if you look at mm -hmm. how the capability building is, is modeled, mm -hmm. and because there are also losses, uh, things that go obs obsolete, and then the way to, to counter obsolescence, that's something else. But if I think Kim Warren does a great job at that, so that part, mm -hmm. if you want to look at it, Which one? the capability of it. Yeah. Um, probably where over time, so oh, yeah. having one comment, mm -hmm. just, uh, instead of going deeper into the model, I think, thank you for sharing all mm -hmm. the under the hood uh, model. If you can take it two steps back, first of all, right. because you have all these sectors or modules to just put them together as names and then how they relate to each other. So that will so help you to tell your either. story mm -hmm. and probably maybe draw your reference mode what is increasing, what is decreasing over time. Mm -hmm. So that, I know that Kim does care about reference mode, but as they are implemented in the model itself. Right. Uh, but also to explain the problem that you have, uh, what is increasing, what is decreasing over time. It's really a dynamic problem that is getting worse or getting better over time. Mm -hmm. um, so even that, those initial graphs I had, just draw those Yeah, just go models. back. And, uh, because yeah, you already absolutely. developed a lot, and I don't think the worry is here, but the worry is what to, inc what to uh, not what to include, include or more go deeper in detail, but what really matters to the problem. Right. What I can take out. And what what I you can, can take out mm -hmm. and really right. make insights and then maybe find out where you can further develop and instead of trying to develop everything to perfection. Maybe it's not worth developing. Right, so thinking about so, what are the, pieces. That yes, are. yes, because you've already proved that you're modeling, you're finding mm -hmm. your, uh, these are not 
specific modeling issues, but rather how do we solve the problem? Right. Thank you very Thank much for you your care. Thank you for your feedback. I appreciate it. So we may chat more later. <laughs> And then I say nay. <laughs> Thank you. Is this your first presentation, Chair? It is. Wow. In this case, we we need to take a selfie. <laughs> okay. Those who present for the first time. Producers, thanks for the presentation. Oh, most of the kind of book. Great was that? Yes. Wow. So it was Christine Bolton. I just didn't want to interrupt your. Thank you. I'm I'm sorry I showed up late. I um Christine is here.